Thanks for inviting me to this uh, really interesting seminar. And I'll try to go a little bit beyond aging and, and take it one step further to rejuvenation and, and discuss this topic and whether it's possible or not. And, uh, but before I go into some of the uh, scientific data on rejuvenation, uh, I'd like to spend a few minutes on, on, on giving a background to uh, human interest in, in aging and, and rejuvenation in immortality, which seems to be kind of an innate interest of humans. And although I see that many of you in this audience probably haven't started thinking about it yet, I promise you that you will in the future. And, and you can see it in the arts uh, that a lot of people are obsessed and interested in this. This is a, a famous drawing by Lucas Grenache uh, called The Elder where you can see that old people are carted in on the left-hand side here, undressed and allowed to go into this fountain of youth. So they come in as old people and miraculously on the other side, they exit the pool as young people. And what they're able to do in this tent, I don't know. That is part of fantasy, I guess. Maybe they're getting new clothes or something. So. Um, why are we so interested and obsessed? There's many individual reasons for that, I think. But again, a theme uh, in the literature uh, is that an old person falls in love with a young person. So the theme of love and attraction is a very common one, of course. And this is one uh, a great example, Goethe's Faust, where the old uh, Dr. Faust falls desperately in love with a young girl. And this is, of course, impossible love. So he decides to kill himself. He make a potion or a, um, a poison actually uh, to commit suicide. But miraculously, the devil, oh, I'm sorry, the, uh, the devil intervenes and change this uh, uh, poison to an elixir for rejuvenation. There's only one hitch and that is he has to pay for that with his soul. Again, that's a common theme in, in the arts uh, that to achieve immortality, you have to trade something, and it's very common, uh, your soul. This is another interesting example in a great book by uh, Oscar Wilde. It's a little bit different because Duran Gray actually does not fall in love with anyone else but himself, or the image of himself as a young boy and uh, how handsome he is. So he wishes that he could stay that way forever. And uh, again, he doesn't make any formal pact with the devil, but clearly he loses his soul by this grant and also all sense of morality. Now, uh, this didn't stop a lot of people, the, 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 the fact that normally uh, people were thinking at rejuvenation and, and a trade-off of the soul, they didn't stop people from, from trying to achieve immortality. And this was, of course, one of the aims and objectives of the alchemists. And the alchemists were not just a bunch of crazy people or a, a small pack. They were all around the world and they were, in, in some cases, very famous and, and outstanding scientists. You have um, Tycho Brahe, uh, the Danish astronomer, Isaac Newton, and even a pope that wasn't afraid of losing his soul, apparently. Um, August Strindberg here in Sweden was a, a famous alchemist as well. Now, the alchemists are rare. Uh, oh, I should say, incidentally, uh, these are some legendary alchemists. And of course, Nicolas Flamel in the myth actually was able to make the Philosopher's Stone in, by which you can uh, gain immortality. And the house in Paris where Nicolas Flamel supposedly made this Philosopher's Stone is still intact. And now there's a restaurant there that you can go to. And, and they say if you go there regularly, you will feel rejuvenated. The, the trade-off in this case, I think, is a, a fa financial one and, and quite severe one. Uh, there's very few or maybe no alchemists around these days, but our obsession has not ended. And, and if you Google anti-aging, this I did uh, actually a couple of years ago, and then I got 142 million hits. And most of these hits are uh, actually for skin care, but we can start with these anti-aging drugs. There are companies that provide anti-aging drugs, online pharmacy for disease treatment, and life extension. That's what they promise, and they look really tasty too. 
Uh, but most of the hits you get from Google, and I, I suspect there's much more now, are skincare products for anti-aging of your skin and, and, and the appearance of aging, I would say. So this is an interesting one I, I, I found. It's a talk-free, dye-free, perfume-free, paba-free, lanolin-free product. So we get to know what it's not in the product, but not actually what the active ingredient is to, to, to rejuvenate your skin. So um, now the question, I guess, you might ask is, do I need to sell my soul or, or do I need to pay for expensive pills and lotions? So is there really a way to alter the rate of aging? And we already heard about this. And again, I would like to point out this seminal discovery did it, uh, that was done in a worm because in a sense you can say that research around aging went to something similar to alchemy to real true aging when people working with Seligans found that a single mutation can actually prolong the lifespan because then we're getting into the bottlenecks of what actually limiting life and, and what sets the rate of aging. Uh, the only thing I would like to point out is, if, uh, uh, which might be interesting, if we look at the worm data and, and, and the mutations ex uh, incidentally had to do with uh, altering uh, nutrient sensing, uh, caloric uh, sensing and signaling, and you will hear uh, a lot more about that in, in, in uh, regulating aging. But if we could extrapolate, let's say we can do the same kind of genetic modification in humans, and get the same kind of lifespan extension. We will go from, from a maximal lifespan around 124 to 310 years, and a, now we'll have a, an average lifespan of 195 years. So this is quite substantial extensions with one single genetic modification. But these mutations that we've talked about so far and that you will hear a lot about have to do with retarding the rate of aging. What about rejuvenation? Is there actually something possible here? Uh, in, and in fact, yes, because there are organisms that use rejuvenation as their normal, in their normal life cycle, in their normal lifestyle. And now I have to introduce one of my favorite ones, which is the yeast Saccharomyces cerevisiae. You probably already know about this. It's the producer of, of um, useful products such as wine, beer, and bread. You might wonder why I picked Italian products. So that's because I, I had this slide for a, a science festival in Bergame and I was kind of showing off a little. Um, anyways, apart from making these nice products, it has a really interesting life cycle. It's a unicellular organism, but it divides asymmetrically. And we have a mother cell, a big mother cell, that gives rise to a small daughter cell. Now, the mother cell is aging. It has a finite capacity to produce these daughters. In, on average, a yeast mother cell can produce 25 daughters or so. So this is something we call replicative aging. I'll come back to that uh, also uh, in, in humans. But so it's age that's interesting, but the other thing, which is uh, almost miraculous, is that uh, even an old mother cell gives rise to a young daughter. So the clock of aging is not only stopped, it's reset. The daughter cell is produced with a full replicative lifespan. So every daughter here can produce 25, okay? In a way, you can say the mother sacrifices itself for rejuvenating a daughter. So uh, this is an interesting model because we think then that the mother cell must accumulate and hold back aging factors. These aging factors cannot leak into the daughter because then the daughter will be born old as well. And the population might go into something called clonal senescence. So what are those aging factors? Uh, whatever they are, we think uh, in principle that they should accumulate with the age of the mother cell for each replication. They should display mother-biased segregation, and what I mean by that is simply that they should be retained in the mother cell and not leak into the daughter. If we could manipulate them to uh, increase the accumulation of whatever factor, it should accelerate aging. 
if we can limit their accumulation, it should extend the lifespan of the mother cell. So this is a neat, simple system in approaching uh, or trying to identify aging factors. And I should say, it looks like in yeast that there are several aging factors that work in parallel. But one interesting one, uh, which Ellen talked about already, is damaged proteins and protein aggregates. Those forms of proteins that we think are the underlying root cause of a lot of neurological diseases, age-related neurological diseases in humans. So we can see that they accumulate during the mother cell uh, replicative lifespan. And some 13 years ago or so, we developed a method to see them in single cells. And we saw that the mother cell is keeping them to themselves during uh, cell division. So the daughter is not inheriting those. And quite recently, um, Sandra, who is here in the audience, was able to genetically modify a yeast uh, such that these aggregates that Ellen talked about did not accumulate so much in this mutant cell. And by uh, inhibiting their accumulation, she was able to see that they lived longer. So we, s we think these forms are true aging factors. And, and Sarah, uh, Sandra's colleague, Sara, uh, um, did the same thing, basically, uh, but with another gene, uh, again pointing at these damaged aggregated proteins are true aging factors. Uh, Nika, a previous student from Slovenia in the lab, did a really cool experiment where she tricked a mother cell to produce twin daughters, but under such a way that one twin daughter as is the normal case, were born without damage, and the other was born with these aggregated proteins. And she was able to see that this one has an accelerated aging phenotype, and this one lived a normal lifespan. So again, pointing at these aggregates being aging factors. Now, from these, we are, of course, really interested in how is the mother cell able to detect that these are things that should not go to the daughter? and what kind of molecular machinery is the mother using for retaining them. So we're hunting genes. We try to find genes that are required for this asymmetrical segregation of damage. And now I'll show you, uh, again, something that looks really cool. This is not the death star. It's actually the live star of yeast. Every little dot here is a gene. And uh, if the genes are close to each other, they mean, that means that they are, they are important for a similar process. And if you take away one of these genes, the neighboring gene is very important to keep you alive. So if there, there's all kinds of, of nodes and, and, and lines between here, but the closer they are, the more important they are for buffering against the loss of the other. And the colors here simply um, show that these are the known genes to be involved in, in discrete functions. Now, when we are hunting genes for the segregation of age-related damage, we can put them on this cell map, and we see that they cluster. And they cluster in functions that have to do with the actin cytoskeleton. And I'll come back to that in an under, other uh, group called endomembrane trafficking. Again, this is the work by by Sanda and, and Beidong and Sing Sing and, uh, uh, in the group. Now, just to, to, to show you how it looks, so if we, if we remove one dot or one gene here in, in this functional group, now the mother cell, uh, the, there, there's actually two things you can see. The mother cell failed to keep the, the damage from the daughter, but you also can see that now the damage looks kind of disgusting all over the cell. It forms these networks or multiple small aggregates rather than these nice big blobs that are normally formed in yeast cells. So what's going on? Uh, just to make uh, or give you a little bit of an idea of what we think is going on mechanistically at the molecular level and why the actin cytoskeleton is important is shown in the next slide schematically. So the actin cytoskeleton are like tracks along the yeast mother cell. They're built here in a, in a structure called the polarisome. And these tracks work for the transport of things into the daughter cell. So the mother cell make, has to, to put a lot of stuff here for the daughter to grow. 
and there are things going along these rail tracks, so to speak. But we also think that these rail tracks are like a glue for the aggregated proteins, the toxic aggregates. So, so this is how we think about it, that these aggregates, green blobs here, are kind of tethered here on this sticky, and they're prevented from diffusing into the protruding daughter cell here. Here you can actually see some evidence for that. This is so-called super-resolution 3D microscopy. Now the actin cable here is in red. We have been able to stain that in red. And you see the aggregates, protein aggregates in green. Doesn't matter how we stain them, but they're green. And you can actually see how they wrap around these cables and are getting immobilized in this way. Uh, this is a blow-up of the polarisome region, and, and these are proteins that are encoded by the genes that you saw in this Death Star map, so to speak. And, and yeah, maybe I'll, yeah, I'll come to that in, in a few slides, so I think I'll talk about it now. So what the polarisome is doing, the actin cables are consisting of building blocks of monomers of actin that make up these beautiful cables. But the monomers are put in here in this polarisome region. That means the cables are pushed backwards, but the transport is normally in the other orientation by so-called motor proteins. But that's something you might remember. The daughter is actually pushing the cables backwards towards the mother. Uh, here's another example of one of these big, beautiful protein inclusions or aggregates. You can see how it associates with the red stuff here, which is the actin. And in this case, the mother cell has kind of wrapped the actin around this structure, and it's prevented from leaking into the daughter cell. Uh, here's a movie that shows what can happen if an aggregate becomes tethered on this cable in the daughter cell. By virtue of having these cables pushed backwards, these aggregates are now moved back into the daughter, so the daughter can free itself from age-related damage in that way. You can also see, which we see uh, over and over again, that this little aggregate fuses with an already existing aggregate in, in the mother cell. Okay, cool. Um, sorry, I'll probably go the wrong way here. Apart from the fact that Yeast is nice because it makes wine, beer, and bread. Why should I care about this being a human being? Uh, how can we go from this knowledge to, to, to humans? Well, I would like to then introduce, and it's been introduced by Thomas earlier this morning, uh, stem cells and, and, and the way that stem, cell, stem cells renew themselves and differentiate. So what is a stem cell? Well, it's a kind of a cell that can either replicate and renew itself or it can differentiate into different cell types. So there are different adult stem cells that can make skin, blood, muscle, neurons, and so on and so forth. Uh, in this, um, well, the question then um, that we and others have asked is the renewal of stem cell linked to segregation of damage like in yeast. So going a bit more in detail in how the cell renewal and differentiation is brought about this is at an early, very early state during uh, cytokinesis in, in which one cell here is now predestined to go through the self-renewal and one is predestined to differentiate into something. Uh, in, for the sake of, of having an example, I've shown you a neuron cell here, okay? Now we can look at this. Um, yeah, that's the one. Uh, we can look at what happens, like in yeast, with damage here. Are they, is it damage all over or is it segregated? It is segregated. So this, man, I'm totally useless uh, in this. Uh, in this case, the, it's, a, a, it's a neuron precursor cell or neuron stem cell from rat. And you can see here that all the damaged proteins are actually going to one of the cells during cytokinesis. And this, incidentally, is the cell that will go on to differentiate. This is the cell that will be renewed. And now this phenomenon has been shown in a lot of other stem cells. This is just one paper from a, a group in Toronto, Buffalino et al., that took different kind of stem cells and saw the same thing. And always is, it's always the case that the cell receiving most damage ha have a shorter life expectancy at the cell level. So 
Is this relevant? Well, it could be. We don't know. So these are questions now. But uh, these kind of asymmetrical divisions occur nicely in, in young individuals, but they fall apart when we get older. A classic example uh, in, in terms of, of there's a failure in cell renewal and during cell division, uh, the both cells are pushed into a differentiated state. That means you deplete your pool of stem cells and your ability to renew. Uh, a classical examples are the stem cells that makes the pigment for your hair, and that's why we become gray-haired, and usually that failure is not fatal unless you become suicidal because you get gray hair or gray beard. But there are other stem cells in which this failure to, to have an asymmetric cell division is much more uh, uh, harmful. Neuron cells is one example. And, and of course, the failure to renew stem cells when you also have a disease protein like an Alzheimer hunting and so on might be very important. So I will finish off by just putting out some questions. Uh, we know, starting to know a little bit about the mechanisms for stem cell uh, segregation of protein aggregates and damaged proteins, but we, we know so far much more in yeast than we do in these systems. And the question is, can we actually boost, when we know what the systems are, can we boost that so we kind of retard the progression into a more symmetrical division of stem cells and the uh, um, uh, depletion of the renewable stem cell population. Can we even maybe reverse this? Can we get an asymmetrical system from something that's already gone into a sy more symmetrical division? That's questions that I put out there because I think they will be important in the future as potential inroads, other inroads into th therapeutic uh, treatment of age-related neurological disorders. Um, I, and I will leave uh, mostly the young people, I guess, with a question, uh, because I, I fear that it's your generation that have to deal with this. And that is, are there actually ways to stop and reverse aging? And, and if and when such ways occur, how will we act? And who are going to get these kinds of, of, of medicines? And I will just point out another a uh, piece of literature that I like very much, uh, or an author, Roald Dahl, um, that in this book, it's called Charlie and the Great Glass Elevator. It's not one of the greatest, it's the sequel to uh, one, one of the greatest, which is Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. Now in this book, Charlie has um, inherited the Chocolate Factory, which you might remember. But the problem is the Oompa Loompas that used to do the work have all left. So he has no manpower. Uh, but of course, Charlie has four uh, grandparents, but they are really old and bedridden. Uh, if you remember the book, they're in bed all the time. So um, uh, Willy Wonka, being a clever man, he, uh, he makes uh, an elixir for rejuvenation. It's called a Wonka bite. And he argues then that if we give uh, a little bit to these grandparents, they will be able to become middle-aged and they should start working in the factory. That's the whole idea. Uh, and one pill is enough to rejuvenate you 20 years or so. But here's a good example of, of uh, Roald Dahl's uh, knowledge about human nature, because what will happen when we have such things? We overdose obviously. So some of these uh, people are saying, I don't want to be just 20 years younger, I want to get back my youth. So one of them become a toddler, a baby, totally useless in the factory. But the, 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 the funniest part is, I think sh her name is Georgina. She takes so much, she becomes minus two, <laughs> which means she ceases to exist. And, and, and Willy Wonka has to, to make an aging drug, find her and give her an aging drug to get her back into existence again. But it, it only, I guess, it, it points out that uh, politically, these type of things will not be just straightforward and easy to deal with. And um, 
Here I put on some stuff that you can read about that will rejuvenate you, uh, no smoking, which is incidentally a bit ironic because the oldest people we know of in, in the human race was a chain smoker. Uh, my grandfather became 102 years old. He smoked a cigar a day, but of course they are statistically outliers. I think it's safe to say that no smoking is, is a good idea. You will hear more about the balanced diet, uh, calories and so on. Um, physical and mental exercise is up there as really uh, good. An apple a day. Uh, it's probably not hurtful, but uh, a good laugh is, is probably the best way forward, I think. Uh, so with that, I will thank you all for listening and point out that some of, of really cool and intelligent people have done the work that I talked about. I haven't talked about all the stuff we do, but I, I like to mention Hugo, Nika, Sandra, Sara, Mikael, Beidong and Sinsin that has been involved in, in the kind of data that I show you today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thomas, for a very nice talk. We have time for questions. Okay, while you're thinking about something, I have a question. Uh, it's about asymmetry, and you mentioned in, in one of your last slides that uh, the asymmetry of segregated damaged proteins is lost in older cells. So the cells that are dividing both are getting damaged proteins. Incidentally, also cancer is a disease of all age, and cancer cells are basically immortal and young. So how does an old body produce young, immortal cancer cells? That's a good question and something I think we should look into more uh, thoroughly. It could be that there's still some kind of asymmetry or segregation, or it could be that cancer cells have, uh, are able to deal with a much higher load of damage than is normally normal for a cell and kind of bypass whatever cell cycle control that normally stop the cell cycle when there's a sensing of high damage and the cancer cells are simply not doing that. Uh, we don't know, but it's yeah. a really good question. Yeah. Thank you. We have a question over here. Uh, okay, so I have a question. I'm here. <laughs> Hi. Um, I was just wondering, these damaged and aggregated proteins, why are they not degraded? Because when, uh, when you see that there's this asymmetrical division, it shows that nature has found a way to deal with them without degrading them. And it is, if they are damaging, it kind of makes no sense to not degrade them. Right. So that, that's a good question. Uh, one answer could be that they're non-degradable. Uh, so there are, there are damaged proteins uh, that are damaged by specific oxidative modifications that are almost impossible for the machineries, the proteases and the proteasome to degrade. So they will accumulate biochemically just because of that fact. The other thing is, uh, or the other answer to your question is more linked to evolution and, and what's uh, what the cost would be. So, as Ellen said, as long as you can put the stuff in these big aggregates, they're not so harmful, actually. So that's one, one way of defense uh, that might be cheaper than to start, even if you could degrade them, because the proteasome, the proteases, they use a lot of energy just to degrade one single protein. So, uh, so the answer is probably around there, but it's a good question, uh, absolutely. I think it's... It's a, it's a bit of both, and, and um, I think it's very important what Ellen pointed out, that you might be able to actually put stuff, damaged stuff, in a place where it's not harmful at all. So that would be maybe preferred in some cases, but in other cases not. If you make these toxic oligomers, you should degrade them, right? Okay, thank you. Sure. I had the same question as him, so... <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Hi, uh, my question is actually about when we figure out how to apply this. And it's not much of an ethical question, it's more just because we have stem cells in our body right now, but they're all specialized. Mm -hmm. How do we intend to introduce this to our body without them specializing to, for example, the liver or the brain? How do we intend, to, how do we stop that process if we uh, introduce these types of stem cells already? 
That's a good question. Uh, I mean, it's early days, but so, so there are two ways, I guess. I don't know if this is an answer to your question, but there, there's two principal ways you can, for example, attack an age-related disorder like Huntington, uh, which is one of these uh, disorders that Ellen talked about where proteins start to make oligomers and aggregates that are toxic. You can try to design a drug, for example, or something that, that is targeting that specific protein right? or, and, and or the cells where that protein exists, like in neurons, for example. Uh, and that will be a drug that will only help patients with Huntington disease if, it, if it's successful. You can also target the protein quality control system that is normally involved, like what, again, what Ellen talked about, all these other factors that are involved in putting the, the, the toxic protein into an aggregate or degrading it or whatever. Now, this will be a more general, and you can imagine that you can do that with nothing that needs to be targeted at all. Now, the, the side effect of such a, a drug could actually be retarded aging. And, and that kind of drug will probably affect people that doesn't have Huntington or Alzheimer. Do you see what I mean? So, so these are important questions for the future, I guess. And, and there's pros and cons on bo both alternatives. A lot of people, scientists I should say, say that it will be really hard to target age-related disorder by targeting them specifically. Maybe we should target aging itself. But that has ethical complications. Thank you. Uh, do we have time for one more question? Okay. Um, actually, um, my question is this: um, Is it could it be possible to uh, uh, try to in induce cell death into the damaged cells um, uh, rather than have them keep uh, causing damage, like uh, misfolding and, and stuff? Uh, that's an interesting idea. You mean that if you, if you have specific cells that actually accumulate the damage, why not just kill them off, right? So is that what you're saying? or Yeah, like more targeting the damaged cells rather than uh, trying to uh, induce... Uh, yeah. Possibly. I'm not so sure that that's a way forward. I think there are some indications that what might be the problem is also the fact that cells sense that they have damage and they go into apoptosis. And maybe they do that at a stage where they could still be functional. So that might in itself be part of the aging process that you kind of, you clean up too much. Uh, so I don't know, it's a good question. I really don't have any good answers to it, but it's complicated. <laughs> right, thank you. Sure. Thank you, Thomas.